Welcome to Wheels Boy. For today's review, we're going to be checking out the IMLS7. This thing is backed by China's largest car maker, SAIC, and it's got a chassis tuned by Formula One's Williams Engineering. But we're going to find out whether it has what it takes to take on one of the toughest segments in the Chinese car market, electric premium SUVs. Prices for the LS7 start around 40,000 US dollars, with our top spec model costing 64,000 US dollars before options. The task given to the designers at IM was a difficult one. Adapt the striking sinister styling of their first model, the IM L7 sedan, to an SUV body. Now, I understand they can't just transplant the front end of a sedan onto an SUV and call it a day, but I'm not sure I love what they came up with. By getting rid of the unique epsilon-shaped daytime running lights of the L7, the resulting design feels a little bit more anonymous. One area in which IM deserves a bit of credit, that I care quite a bit about, is in terms of colors. This thing is available in some pretty nice shades, all of which are named after famous artists. Now, I happen to have taken a brochure from a nearby dealership, so let's have a look at some of the available colors. We have uh, Van Gogh Blue, Monet Green, Vermeer Yellow, and finally, this particular shade, Raphael T. T, as in the drink. They even went so far as to include color-matching wheels, joining the Porsche Taycan and bringing back a trend that died in the early 2000s and, let's be honest, probably should have stayed dead. Speaking of other manufacturers, this rear end is beautiful. It's also pure Aston Martin. Behind the LED panel on the rear is 722 liters of cargo space, much more than competitors like the Denza N7 and Neo ES6, but that's no surprise, considering the LS7 is around 20 centimeters or 8 inches longer than either of them. But despite being longer even than the Model X, at just 56 liters, the front of the LS7 is about one-third the size of the Teslas. Just take a seat inside hit the brake pedal and close the electronically operated front doors. Front doors only, not rear doors, and only available on this top spec car. Interior review, well, let's start by addressing the elephant in the room, which is this thing that's staring at me right here. This half steering wheel kind of yoke type thing, a la the Tesla Plaid models. I won't mince words, I don't get this. I don't understand what it brings to the user experience apart from looking a little bit more sci-fi maybe. In exchange for that, you have something that is less ergonomic and harder to use than a traditional wheel. Now, this is a no-cost option, so it's not as though IM is forcing you to choose it over a traditional round wheel. In fact, they said that about 50% of their customers are picking this over the round wheel. If you are one of those people who thinks that this is super cool and you'd love to have it instead of a traditional wheel, more power to you, but personally, I would just stick with a good old wheel. The LS7's front row is among the lightest and airiest I've ever experienced in a modern car. And credit to that goes to this, the Starfall windshield. This thing extends the boundaries of a traditional windshield until they stop right above the driver's head. Now, this thing is triple paned and tinted, so you don't have to worry about getting major sunburn or increased NVH in exchange for that expansive view. The only downside, as far as I can tell, is that it makes the car look like it has a bit of a receding hairline. The rest of the interior is largely similar to that of the L7. That means the triple screen setup is maintained. There is a 26.3 inch screen that acts as your instrument cluster and your center screen, as well as a 12.8 inch lower screen where you'll find most of your functions like your air conditioning, your media, and your navigation. This is a bit different than the one in the L7 because it's actually integrated into the dashboard instead of floating. It does look a little better in my opinion, but it retains one of the problems that the L7 had, which is the fact that this angle does result in a little bit of glare sometimes when you're driving, making it hard to see some of the things on the screen. The third screen, the passenger screen, is another area of improvement over the L7. That sedan had a big black space right here between the center screen and the passenger screen. Not so on the LS7. By getting rid of that, not only does it look better, but you also have a larger passenger screen, 15.5 inches instead of 12.3. Oh, and they can still do this.
Below the center screen, you have four touch buttons, one for your air conditioning, one for your hazard lights, one for SOS, which will obviously call emergency services, and finally, DLP. DLP stands for Digital Light Projection, which in layman's terms means the LS7 can project images onto the ground in front of it or onto flat surfaces, like a wall. The former includes things like arrows to signal pedestrians that they can cross in front of the car, while the latter includes a variety of light shows. The only other touch buttons in the front row are over here. They control the windows, and honestly, the less I say about those, the better. I dislike them on the L7 and I dislike them here for the same reason. They are inconvenient to use. Apart from that, not a lot for me to complain about. This thing is soft and luxurious when it comes to material qualities, apart from this kind of black plastic trim here in the middle. I really like the fishbone pattern on this real wood trim that you can find throughout the car. The speakers, by the way, up to 24 of them. You can either have 12, 16, or in this top spec car, 24. And yes, it is loud enough to blow out your eardrums if that's what you're looking for. Many new Chinese EVs come with built-in dash cams, but none are quite like the one on the LS7. Its camera isn't inside the cabin, it's mounted inside a retractable unit on the roof and can film in 2K or 4K resolution. When equipped with the optional luxury seat package, the driver and passenger seat of the LS7 are heated, cooled, and massaging, as well as highly adjustable. That includes not just the adjustable thigh bolsters, but also headrests. The real show, however, begins in the back row. That's because if you've got the cash, you can option this seat. Not only does it have adjustability forward and aft like this, as well as adjustable rake and thigh rests and leg rests and everything, as well as adjustable headrest, it also has heated cooling and massaging functions. Now those are controlled using those annoying touch buttons, just like the front window switches, but I'm willing to forgive them because of this one button right here. This activates the weightless mode for the right rear passenger seat. Not only does the seat tilt and recline, the front passenger seat folds and slides neatly under the dashboard, giving you plenty of space to stretch out. This is probably the most comfortable I've ever been inside of a vehicle, but I also can't help but feel a little bit unsafe to use this thing while the car is moving, which you can, by the way. IM does tell me that the seats and seatbelt were designed to make sure the occupant doesn't just slide into the dashboard in the event of an accident, but I hope I don't have to test that design. That's not the only problem. While this thing can recline, it can't fold down like the left and center seats, which cuts into cargo space. It also looks a bit uh, out of place when viewed from behind, like you added an aftermarket rear seat to your car. There are definitely not as many creature comforts for the passenger over here, though they do get seat heating. Fold down this center armrest and you've got a Type-C charging port right there, as well as some pretty trick cup holders. Press down to open them like that, and then pull up to collapse. Folding that up, rear of the center console, we have our air conditioning controls, and finally, a final Type-C charging port right down here. The LS7 is available with a single rear electric motor or dual motors. You can also choose between three different ternary lithium battery packs, measuring 77, 90, and 100 kilowatt hours. When equipped with a single motor powertrain, they provide 502, 610, and 660 kilometers of range on the CLTC cycle, respectively. 
The dual motor powertrain is only available with the 90 or 100 kilowatt hour battery packs, which provide a range of 550 and 625 kilometers, respectively. Now, those numbers are roughly equivalent to what you would get from Chinese competitors like the Xpeng G9 and Neo ES6, but I'm not so sure about the charge time for the LS7. You see, I wasn't able to find an official 20 to 80% charge time, but I'm fairly certain that it's not going to do as well as the Xpeng G9 or the ES6. That's because this thing rides on a 400 volt architecture, and I know that it has a max charging power of 150 kilowatts. The G9 has an 800 volt architecture, so I know it's going to charge faster, and the Neo, well, it has battery swapping. I know for a fact that this thing is slower to 100 kilometers per hour than either the Neo or the Xpeng, despite having more power, 425 kilowatts and 725 newton meters of torque. Now, a 0 to 100 kilometer per hour time of 4.5 seconds isn't going to be disappointing to your average driver, but it's also not going to earn you any bragging rights in this segment. But what you really want to know about is the chassis. You know, the one that was tuned by Williams Engineering? The same was true of the L7 sedan, but that didn't leave me particularly impressed. The LS7 is a different story. I think the LS7 rides better than the L7 and still has admirably good body control for such a large, heavy SUV. I'm not sure, however, if I should credit that to the team over at Williams or to the fact that this car has adaptive air suspension, something that wasn't available on the L7. Now, an air suspension is not going to cover up a bad chassis, and this is not a bad chassis. It's a good one. The air suspension just lets it shine. I can't say that the LS7 is any more engaging or involving to drive than any other SUV in this segment. The steering is light without a lot of feedback. The same could be said for the brake and the accelerator pedal as well. The difference between the air suspension settings, your comfort sport, snow mode and everything, well, they're perceptible but not huge. They're all comfortable and the sport mode isn't going to shake your teeth out of your head. My only complaint, and it's a minor one, is with the regen. I don't think it's aggressive enough. There's definitely no one pedal driving in this car. Air suspension isn't the only upgrade the LS7 receives over its stablemate. There's also the newly available dual roof-mounted LiDAR units from RoboSense. Those enable highway navigation on autopilot, which I was able to use during a 45-minute commute on both elevated roads and highways. During that limited time, I found the system to be reliable and easy to use. The L7 sedan may be the better looking of the two models from IM, but this LS7 is undoubtedly the better executed. Whether it's tech, performance, or comfort, it has what it takes to compete in this hotly contested segment.